Hi, Andy, we've lost sound now. But better? I'm trying not to upset them. Yeah. OK. Um, so typically two pictures here of what we normally see on the high rail RCF, but also often <laughs> on the low rail tight radius curves, another form of RCF, which we uh, which we get rather in contact with the And then, of course, what we don't want, the nice fracture face, so crack growth area, and then the fracture face you get when you, you break a rail. So really, um, although I started off as a specialist in fracture mechanics, when I started researching the subject, um, I really got interested in understanding the forces that were going into the top of the rail in the contact patch to actually try and work out what was making these things grow. Until then, um, if you look back, a lot of uh, all the earlier research that was done was very much focused on the contact stress in the what's happening in the in the contact patch, so the vertical force. Um, but what I really got interested in is the other forces in the contact patch. And that is what we now know to be driving these. So that is the main thing that I'm going to be talking about today, which is really about wheel set dynamics. We can't really properly manage rails until we understand what the vehicles do to the track. And the thing about vehicles is they're all different. They've got different wheel profiles. They've got different suspension design, which means they all behave differently when they get to the same piece of track. And it's about understanding what actually happens there. And the other thing to remember is that not only do we have the vertical forces being generated within the contact patch, but we have lateral and longitudinal forces. And very often when we talk about longitudinal forces, people think, oh yeah, I know about them, that's traction and braking forces. No, no. The forces in the longitudinal direction that we generate when a vehicle goes around a curve can actually be significantly bigger than the forces that we generate under traction and braking loads. So these are the ones that do most of the damage. So we need to understand how vehicles actually steer around curves. For which you need to turn your camera around. Yeah. And you lot need to become active participants. Right. So, so yeah. Yeah, we're trying to set it up in the middle. Okay, do we have any track designers in the room? Because I need someone to build me a railway track. Come on, gather around. Come on, look by me. <laughs> you haven't got to enjoy yourselves. So, what I would like is a straight leading to a reverse curve. Okay. You can do the reverse curve. I would never allow to play with my goodness well on your track. We should, does it matter what end the, the reverse curve is on? Well, no, I mean we can we can move it round, but I want I want the straight to be at the beginning and the reverse curve at the other end. <laughs> Not in the middle, in other words. Yeah, don't don't put it in the middle. Not enough. No. Big one, that's fine. I know it's in the right place, it just for some reason it's just a long bigger reverse curve. Uh, bigger reverse curve than that. Bigger reverse curve than that. No, yeah, much bigger. Yeah. So two, two each way. So it's yeah. 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 Oh, but I'm not um, qualified. There's other more qualified people in the room putting small tracks back the other way. I'll give you some advice that everyone's going to get picked on at some point. So if you don't participate in this bit, you're going to get so we don't need the straight on the end. You don't want the straight on no, the end. No, I don't want the straight. Straight on the end now. Straight on the end. Could you just put put another curve on? Put what? another curve bit on the end there. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Oh, right. Is that is, is that in your yep, that's camera in the, in vision? The, in the view, yeah. Okay. So what I have got here 
is I have got a very simple wheel set. Okay, a wheel set consists of an axle and two wheels. Okay, in this case, they just happen to all have the same diameter. So we're going to start with victim number one. So very simple. Run it down the track and see what happens. Oh. <laughs> Take it back to the beginning, give it a bit more. That's it. Now it's really good on the track. Yeah. It'd be brilliant for running on a piece of straight track. The trouble is, as soon as it hits a curve, so the track moves underneath it to one side, it's got absolutely no way of knowing that the track has moved and it needs to move with the track. So it just keeps running in a straight line. So cylindrical wheels don't work. We tried them in early railways and had to put flanges on the inside to stop them derailing. And then all you do is you wear the flanges out. So they don't work. So we go, aha. What happens if we have a wheel set with a coned wheel profile on it? These two wheels are constrained, they must rotate at the same speed because they're fixed together. So now when the track moves underneath it, one wheel gets bigger, the other wheel gets smaller, therefore it will rotate with the track. You've got, you know, you've got a bit of a gap in there. We've got a bit of a kink there, haven't we? We've got non-continuous ground. Yeah. Oh. It's not I like that. We tried it on the curve. Did in the body of the curve at the moment. Stay here so you can get it right. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you noticed something? Just what it did just then. Curve yeah, goes that way, it goes the other way. So, in this one, we've got two cone wheels. It sits in the middle of the track. If it sits perfectly in the middle of the track, it will run down the straight absolutely fine. But the trouble is now that when the track moves underneath it, so when it gets to a curve, this wheel gets bigger and this wheel gets smaller. The track's gone. The track's gone that way, so it's going around the right hand curve. But now this one's bigger and that one's smaller. So this one rotates faster or further. So it actually steers in the opposite direction to the curve, which is what you saw there. Yeah. So we've got wheels which don't steer, which try to steer, but they always steer in the wrong direction. So the solution to that is to put the cone on the other way around. So we've now reversed the direction of the cone. So now when the track goes that way, this wheel gets bigger. And that one gets smaller. So hopefully it should turn back towards the full over centre line of the track. Do you want to go, sir? I will. Okay, notice when it's displaced on the straight track that it just steers back towards the centre yeah. of the track. And when it gets into the curve, give it a bit more money. <laughs> Something. <laughs> All the room time was obviously up much level. There we go. But it's able to steer around those curves. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, did well. What was the word that was used? Hunting. Hunting, yeah. So, hunting is an unstable motion of the wheel set, which can be set up, usually set up when the vehicle's on straight track, in that it just travels from side to side. So, basically, what's happening is it moves partly off centre, the wheel gets bigger, that one gets smaller, see itself back towards the centre of the track, overshoots, and it just keeps operating from side to side down the track. So, an important property of this wheel set is actually what the angle of this cone is. And that we refer to as the conicity. We come across the term conicity. So, conicity is basically a measure of the geometric interaction of the wheel with the track, and it depends on the effective angle of that cone. So, if we take another one, which also has the cone angle in the same direction, but has a steeper cone angle around this spot, we can see what happens. Well, the next. <laughs> So that one steers as well. Turn them both down. And observe the differences between them. Does anybody want to venture one of the differences between them? Straight, but better in the curve. What about that one? That one. I see. So when you say it behaves so well on the straight. It was more unstable on the straight. It was. Yeah. Yes. It's got a higher conicity. So if you set them both down at the same time, this one on the straight track oscillates with a shorter wavelength that gives you a more violent motion from side to side. So it's actually more prone to hunting because of the higher conicity. Whereas that the one below the conicity is a lot more stable on straight track. The downside is that when it gets to a curve, this one needs to move pretty much all the way to the outside of its wheel profile to be able to itself around the curve. We moved into snooker now. <laughs> so this one with a steeper cone angle means that to generate the same difference in the radius between the two wheels, it doesn't have to move so far to the outside of the curve because it's steeper. So it actually steers by having less movement to the outside of the curve. So it's jiggling around quite a lot, but it's actually not moving too far away from the center line of the, of the track. So this one is really good at going outside of radius curves. So you translate that to a wheel set of flanges, this one can go around tighter radius curves before you're going to get flange contact than that one can. So this one is a lower conicity, this one is a higher conicity. The conicity is related to its propensity to hunting, but also is a measure of how well it can steer. So this one is quite stable and won't hunt, but it's not very good at going around tight radius curves. Whereas this one, more prone to hunting and speed on straight track, but it will get you around much tighter radius curves without having any flange contact on it. Historically, we have moved from a low conicity railway to what you might call a moderate conicity railway. So, in his in his days when he started on the railway, everything had a P1 wheel profile on it, which was a straight one in twenty cone. Now, just about everything has got a P8 wheel profile on it, which gives you a much higher conicity because it gives you better steering. But to combat that hunting, we've had to make various other changes to the way that we design rolling stock. OK, everyone happy with that? Brilliant. You're all dynamics experts now. <laughs> so the next little diversion we're going to explore is something called the independent rotating wheel set. So these get used quite a lot on tram systems. And BR played with it as well in the 1980s. And basically, you've got 
two wheels with a common center, common axle, but they are now independent of each other. So who wants to go next? You're gonna have a go? No. You'll have to, you'll have to walk I'm afraid. <laughs> Or we, or we could move the railway. Yeah, no. Press the food and take your notes. So you are in the try. Our special wheel set with independent rotating wheels. Right. So, so you can just put it down on the track and give it a kick and see what happens to it. Yeah. Okay. Do you know why it comes off? It doesn't really work. That's happening again. Yeah. yeah. So effectively, well, the other ones are put it away. But these work because the two wheels have to rotate at the same speed. Right. So when one gets bigger and one gets smaller, it introduces a yaw motion, which allows it to steer. With independent rotating wheels, we've actually disconnected that requirement for them both to rotate at the same speed. So when this one moves away from the center line of the track and this wheel wants to go faster, yes, you can do it with the effect that it just turns itself around in the middle of the track and it derails itself. So, why do they use these on tram systems? You've got very sharp curves. Yeah. So on a, on a tram system, you need to get around 10 metre radius curves. In extremis, yes. <laughs> and, and no wheel set with a conventional conicity will steer you round without flange contact on such a tight radius curve. So on trams, they often, don't, not always, but they do tend to use these and say, OK, we'll, we'll not worry about the, the steering bit. The downside is that when they design the wheel profiles for these, they have to design them with steeper flange angles because the wheel profiles do spend a lot more time in flange contact because on straight track it's going to be guided by the flange that also means that when it goes into a curve it's more likely to derail because there's no steering motion guiding it back towards the center of the track so you put a steeper angle on the flange to try and enhance its resistance for the flange to actually want to climb up the side of the rail the benefit it has on tram systems is the fact that because you've disconnected the two wheels, you can have a low floor tram. You haven't got a conventional bogey that you need to step over. So if you've got a low floor tram, which people are going to be stepping on it from, from curb heights, you can have that all the way through. So the independent rotating wheels, they don't work here. <laughs> Having said that, there is a research project um, which has been taking place where They've got independent rotating wheels, but they're individually motored. And so the train is monitoring where the track goes. And when it sees the center line of the track move, it applies a bit more power to the motor on the opposite side. So it actually manually steers the wheel back towards the center line of the track. That's an unnecessary, unnecessary complication to me. But... Well, it gives you perfect steering yeah. and, no, and no steering. Point. So that's wheel sets. Finally, let's just look at what happens when you put those two just, wheel sets. Just before we move on, we got a question from uh, Rob, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's asked uh, when you're moving to the P8, uh, when moving to P8, moderate con conicity, what additional changes are made to combat hunting? Well, uh, I think that's coming in terms of. Uh, yes. Yeah, so basically, it, it, it was fundamental design uh, changes to the way that we design vehicle suspensions. And it really came about because of a better understanding of vehicle dynamics. So in reality, what we've seen there is the behavior you get with independent wheel sets, which are not constrained by a bogey or a suspension system. 
in reality, we put two wheel sets inside a bogey, and even two wheel set vehicles, it's basically a long bogey vehicle. So in this case, back to basics, we've got two cylindrical wheels, but we've got flanges on them this time. Um, or do you want to do this one the nearest? So it doesn't have any steering until the flange hits the side of the rail as we saw before. But actually, there's a lot of friction there. It pretty quickly comes to rest in the flange contact because of just that friction. It shows how it doesn't work. But I've got this end of the table now. Do the question? There's no questions. There's no questions. Come on. <laughs> so brilliant. That's it, job done. You can sit down now. <laughs> so I, it, it's probably not possible for you all to see this unless Andy can move the camera over the top. But this is actually a really good illustration about how wheel sets really behave in practice. Because if you look down on the top of this, you'll see that the leading wheel set in bogey has actually shifted towards the outside of the curve and is actually steering the bogey through the curve. So it's actually shifted towards the outside of the curve. It's not quite in flange contact. The trailing wheel set, the one following it behind, is just sat in the middle of the track. Right. So that is your work colleague who doesn't do anything all day, just takes the credit for all the project work. That's it. He sits there, he's just a passenger, doesn't do anything. And he's just sat there in the middle of the track. So he's not contributing anything or very little to the actual steering. And if you look at it, that wheel set is actually lined up pretty well with the sleepers in the curve. So that wheel set is actually on the radial line going pointing towards the middle of the curve. So it's got no angle of attack to the rail and it's sat in the middle of the track. This one moved towards the outside of the curve. It's got an angle of attack to the sleepers. You can see there's quite a sharp angle there. And it's moved towards the outside of the curve. So it's the leading wheel set for bogey that's doing all the work in steering around the curve. So I don't, I don't know if people want to get up and have a look just to confirm that. Yeah. Good Well, rail inclination will affect the conicity. Yeah. Um, yeah. But our wheel profiles are based on a one in 20 cone because our rails are inclined at one in 20. Yeah, so the, the reason why we do that is the, the, um, we incline the rails at one in 20 because we use a one in 20 cone wheel. And that means that the contact generally should be round about the top of the rail and the normal force is going through the contact patch will then be directed through the web of the rail. Whereas, when they're vertical, the contact is more towards the edge corner of the rail, and then you'll get a, a bending moment on the rail. Yeah. So it's it, the rails can better resist the, the vertical forces by having them inclined like that. Okay. Has everyone seen that who wants to see it? Yeah. We're all happy. Brilliant. So we all know about vehicle dynamics now. That's it. So that's the basics of how wheel sets work. So I think you want the camera back on near here. Yeah. And back on the screen. So we talked a bit about hunting. Hunting's not good. And um, that is what hunting does to the track. So if you have a vehicle that's hunting, so the wheel sets are moving uncontrollably from side to side, and you haven't good, got good lateral resistance in your track, the motion of the wheel sets will imprint themselves on the track. 
And so you see you get this nice sine wave in the track. The wavelength of that sine wave is directly related to the cone angle, which is on the wheel set. So you could work out the distance between the two peaks in that curve, and that would tell you directly what the kinesthetic of that wheel set was when it was hunting. Because it's a it's a kinematic um, parameter or characteristic of that particular cone angle. As you sharpen or steepen that cone angle and the kinesthetic goes up, the wavelength you get will be shorter, which means also the frequency at which it oscillates will, will increase. So the higher the speed, the higher the frequency. From the track point, uh, from the vehicle point of view, this is a video. And whatever happens to the sound is going to be a potluck. potluck. But I'll try and run this video. So you can see there's a lot of vibration going on in the back pad. This was filmed by the guard on his phone because he was terrified and absolutely no idea what was happening. All he knew was that he didn't like this banging sound. That banging sound are the wheels oscillating into hunting. So what I'll ask you to do is look out of the window and look at the track and see if you see anything wrong with it. Okay, hunting stops. Stopped about there. Did you see any change in the track that was obvious as to why it would suddenly stop hunting? You've gone from continuous vertical road to jointed track? No. Probably. I think it's something in the ballast. The ballast changed colour. Which means a different ballast. Different ballast? So the renewal. Okay. No. There, it, the, the piece of track had recently been re-railed. But there was nothing done to the ballast. There was no renewal done. Change the gauge? No. No, and say it was just re railed. So the gauge is the same. Yeah, so it was just the rail profile. So what we'd actually done was uh, re rail this. Originally, this was all jointed track. Um, and we'd re railed part of it with a uh, new bullhead rail. Thought it was Might be. Uh, yeah, a place called Newton St. Tyres. Yeah. 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 On the, yeah, Barnstable Line out of Exeter. Um, and so to, to help understand what happened, um, so we went down. This is a, a, a conicity map of this particular site. So the, the vehicle in this case was actually traveling from right to left. So what we did was we went down, remembering the conicity is a function of the interaction, the geometric interaction between the wheel and the rail. So it depends on the wheel profile, the rail profile, and also the track gauge. Because obviously as you move the two rails apart, you're gonna change where the contact point is on the wheel, which means you're gonna change that effective cone angle. So walk through the site, we measured rail profiles, we measured track gauge, and then we also went to the depot and measured all the wheel profiles of all the vehicles that were having trouble with that piece of track. And what we can do is we can then calculate what the conicity is on that piece of track. So you can see the red line here is for a new P8 profile. And the conicity is reasonably okay, stays reasonably constant. This is where it had been re-railed with new bullhead rail, this was the old heavily worn uh, 109 pound rail. But you can see with a brand new pro wheel profile, it's actually okay, it's not too bad. But as soon as that wheel profile starts to get a bit of wear on it, the conicity goes up significantly. And this limit 0.6 is the stability limit for the vehicle. So it basically means that when the conicity gets above that limit, the suspension is not able to prevent hunting of that of that wheel set now. So it cannot damp out all the forces and hold the wheel set steady. So we are getting hunting, significant amounts of hunting on wheels when they get to a certain amount of wear. The difference, the only thing that's different between there and there is the rail profile. Basically we've done, we replaced it with a 95 pound bullhead rail when the previous profile 
look like this with a much shallower uh, gauge shoulder on it. So the higher gauge shoulder you have with ball head rail makes it more prone to hunting with things like a, a northern PA profile. So it's very small changes can have a big impact of what actually happens at the wheel rail interface. The other thing, of course, if you get lots of hunting, you're putting lots of force into the track, you have the risk of derailment. Um, and it was really through the 1960s that vehicle dynamics really started to be researched and looked into. And it was as a result of the increasing number of derailments we were having, particularly of freight trains. Four wheeled wagons were particularly prone for bouncing off track, and no one really knew why. Um, and the number of derailments we got grew exponentially through the 1960s. Um, so the red line down here is the number of derailments on running lines of freight trains. And so through the 1960s, we had this sudden increase. As we started to increase continuous welded rail, diesel traction, so we were sort of raising the speed of freight trains, but also the track geometry was getting better. So there were none of those joints which could actually break up some of that hunting motion. The geometry was a lot more consistent, which allowed that instability to start to build until such a point when the wheel set actually managed to climb out and derail. So it was only through this period, through the 1960s, when vehicle dynamics research really started to take place and we started to understand what was causing this and started to put in place measures to combat it and better design of vehicle suspensions. So the point where we are now, where the number of derailments we have are down into the, the handful that we get a year. Um, this was one of the first ones that was investigated where really they didn't find anything that was particularly wrong with either the vehicle or the track. And it was a bit of a mystery and that um, led to more research taking place. But one of the more famous ones is this one. Anyone spot where this one is? I know you all know, I know. Anybody want to venture where this one was? East Coast somewhere? So yeah. East Coast. <clears throat> yeah, first, 1968. Um, so it was a, um, so yeah, north of, north of York, a freight train running. Um, one of the wagons near the back of the train derailed due to instability. It was actually, well, when they did tests on it afterwards, they actually found that hunting started at 19 miles an hour on that wagon. So it was a very unstable wagon. So the uh, one of the wagons at the rear derailed. Driver at the front had absolutely no idea what was going on, so he just carried on. And it was this train, which was on the on the fast lines in the centre, which um, actually suddenly uh, found that it was yeah going into a cloud of dust. No no idea what it was, and it was the the wagon in front um, digging it out. Yeah, it's the DP too. Yes, yes, it was, it was one of the experimental diesel uh, locos. Um, and there were about four fatalities, I think, from the passenger train here. And when it fell into the wreckage of. Okay. Um, and what was the name of the first you know, do you know what? Um, I think it was around rugby on the old Great Central Line. Yeah, not rugby. West when, when, when I came in, no, we, we were still having four wheel wagon derailments all over the place. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So, bit of history. So, going back just to this wheel set, let's just quickly look what's happening. So, when we've got this wheel set, which is on its own steering round curve, um, obviously the, the outer rail of the curve is longer than the inner rail. And if the wheel set can position itself so that the radius on the outer wheel is in the same proportion to the radius on the inner wheel as the difference in the length between the two curves, then that wheel set will start rotating at the same rate at which the track is, and it will, you'll get perfect steering. It will steer around that curve perfectly. Unfortunately, If it doesn't get to that position and it moves further away from the centre line of the track, 
then the wheel set will be trying to turn, but we'll get equal and opposite forces being generated in the contact patch trying to turn the wheel set back towards the centre line of the track. So this is where those longitudinal steering forces come from that I talked about at the beginning. It's basically the wheel set overshooting the track and it, it, it trying to steer itself back. So that's where the longitudinal forces come from. And equally, we can have some lateral forces as well, because as we can see there, that wheel set has got uh, an angle of attack to the rail. So as soon as it gets an angle of attack and starts to rotate when it's trying to steer itself back towards the centre line of the curve, there's a lateral resisting force because the wheel set's trying to run off in this direction and there's a force back from the rail to push it back. So this is how, when a vehicle is steering, we're generating longitudinal and lateral forces in the contact patch. And it's those which give us all our, uh, all our nice damage on the head of the rail. So when you get that hunting motion, that side to side oscillatory motion, we start to get that yawing of the wheel set that generates a lateral force. And then it gets back towards its normal position, your motion in the opposite direction. And we get the, these varying forces steering it around the curve. So in reality, as we've seen there, the two wheel sets are constrained within a bogey by the suspension system. The forces that are generated here and the positions those wheel sets get into in a curve depends on a number of things. It depends on how stiff that suspension is. Because the stiffer the suspension, the more work that the, the wheel set needs to do to overcome the stiffness of the suspension. And it generates those forces by moving further towards the outside of the curve. So if this is stiffer, this moves further towards the outside of the curve, so it can generate more force here. So forces on the top of the rail go up as the suspension gets stiffer. It also gets stiffer if we move the two wheel sets apart. Because if you think about it, when it goes around the curve, those two wheel sets want to move in opposite directions to each other. The further away they apart they are, the more they need to rotate. So the bigger the force will get in, the, in there. And obviously also the tighter the radius of the curve. The tighter the radius of the curve, the more the wheel sets need to shift, the bigger the force that we get. So you can, you can get perfect curving on straight track. If curving on straight track is not a <laughs> contradiction, yeah. yeah. And if you're lucky, you can actually see that this really does take place. Um, so this is a result of a simulation of a vehicle going around a curve. You can see that the leading wheel set has moved most towards the outside of the curve and it's got an angle of attack. The trailing wheel set is sat in the middle and these green and blue lines, which are the forces, are pretty small. It's got the biggest forces. This is actually a picture of a, a vehicle on a tight radius curve. This is the inner rail of the curve. I don't know if you can see it, but you can actually see there's a shadow under there because the trailing wheel set is shifted right towards the inside of the curve. So the field side of the wheel is actually hanging over the side of the rail. Whereas on this case, it's not. The wheel is actually moved in the opposite direction. So the leading wheel moves towards the outside of the curve. The trailing wheel moves towards the inside of the curve. So these, these things really do happen. And as I said, as we make the suspension stiffer, these forces go up. Now remember, when we've got a higher kinesity wheel, it's more prone to hunting. The way we stop it hunting is by stiffening up the suspension to hold it more rigid when it wants to go unstable. The downside of that is you hold it more, more rigid it's better on straight track, but as soon as it gets into a curve, it has to generate an almighty force to actually try and overcome that stiffness to steer itself around the curve. So what we see as that curve radius gets tighter, so we move this way on the graph, with stiffer suspensions, the forces that we generate within the contact patch go up, and they go up a lot. And it's those which cause a lot of the surface damage that we see, not just rolling contact fatigue, but other forms of damage as well. What we can see here is, so this is those forces translated into a measure of the amount of fatigue damage, which is done on the head of the rail. And as, as we stiffen up the suspension, each of these curves moves this way. But on the stiffest vehicles, you end up actually being able to generate damage on a very wide range of curves, right out to 2,000 metres, 2,500 metre radius. Whereas on the old vehicles, which had much softer suspensions and P1 wheel profiles, 
you only get damage on the very tight radius curves. So you're actually making things a lot worse by stiffening up those suspensions. And a good example of that is what happened on Wessex in the early 2000s. Um, what we did, we as an industry did, wholesale was pretty much replace old Mark 1 slam door stock with very dodgy, not steering very well suspensions, which were nice and very bouncy, with much better riding, stiffer suspensions and P8 wheels in the Desiro fleet. Overnight, we had almost a complete change. And effectively, we moved from this curve to this one. And in consequence, we suddenly got a very large number of 1A RCF defects being generated on that route. And at the time, it was a surprise to everyone. But in hindsight, we can look back and we can go, well, we ought to have thought about that and realised what was going on. But you know, like most things, it's all better in hindsight, isn't it? Hindsight is an exact science. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so really, what have we done since then? Now we know a lot more about the forces, the fact what actually happens and the damage that they cause. What as an industry are we actually doing? This is very much what coming into the realms of what my day job is. So one of the things that we want to do as an industry is incentivize train operators to reduce primary yaw stiffness. They like having stiff suspensions. They don't have to do much maintenance on them. Because if, if your rubber bushes don't move very far, they're not, you're not going to wear them out, are you? So they like having stiff suspensions because they get long maintenance periodicities and a long life out of them. But one of the things we've done is to look at track access charging. So every train operator has to pay a track access charge. And one component of that is what's known as the variable usage charge. And what they pay is in proportion to the amount of wear and tear that each vehicle does to the infrastructure. And we've been able to incorporate into that charge a component which is to do with the rail surface damage. So that's linked directly to the, the your stiffness or the suspension stiffness of their bogies. So the graph shows primary your stiffness on this axis and the amount of uh, the amount you pay, the component of the variable usage charge you pay in the surface damage term as a function of that. This axis is in pence per vehicle mile. It's not very much. But actually, if you can move your suspension stiffness from here down to here, you're going to save yourself 2p a vehicle mile. May not be much, but if you're a train operator with, say, 50 10 car multiple units, you're doing a quarter of a million miles for each vehicle a year, which is not unrealistic these days. You're actually going to save yourself two and a half million pounds in operating costs a year. So I'll take that. I could do with two and a half million pounds a year. <laughs> but it's actually, yeah, so it's actually, uh, you know, a saving that's worthwhile to have for a relatively small reduction in the cost. But it does reflect how much better the softer suspensions are to our track and the less work we have to do. We've also been trying to influence new train design. Um, an example of this is the Class 700, so the Thameslink fleet. Um, we wrote a train infrastructure interface specification, TIIS, which was basically network rails view of what the train needed to look like to be compatible with its infrastructure. So it had lots of stuff in it about, you know, gauging and, you know, electrical capability and EMC and stuff. But it also had a section in it about wheel rail interface. And what we did was to put in a requirement. We said what we think the force you should be able to generate on in the contact patch on each curve radius. We put a limit to what that should be. So we think that you can design a vehicle which will put less force than this line in that term into your design. So the requirement was they had to do the simulations to prove that their force was less than that. What was actually delivered was a very nice, lightweight inside frame bogey. The inside frame is beneficial because it's reduced mass, so it's reduced unsprung mass as well because the axles have got inboard bearings, so the, the axles are smaller, 
So it's actually a very track friendly bogey with a soft yaw suspension and quite a tight wheel set space team. It was very different from everything that Siemens had ever offered us before. So this was actually able to drive almost like a step change in the, in the vehicle designers thinking about what it was they wanted to provide. The benefit of that is that when it comes to Siemens then offering further vehicles for other training operators, this becomes their default bogey offering. And that's now used in the 707 and the 717 fleet. So a specification for one fleet, getting that right means that we get benefits for other fleets. Very similar story for Crossrail. So a similar set of requirements were for the 345s for Crossrail. If you remember Crossrail, uh, very high frequency timetable, absolutely no access to track in the core section. It's really paramount that those trains do as little damage to that infrastructure as possible because we haven't got the opportunity to go in and fix it. So again, another type requirement came out. So in this case, Bombardier came out with a very nice design and that's now perpetuated in the other follow on orders that it's got for the other TOCs. So what we're having here is now being spread elsewhere on the network and other parts of the network rail will be seeing the benefits of that. In other areas, there was research done on a variable stiffness bush. Um, the Hall bush, anybody heard of the Hall bush? Um, so this was a, a German design. So it's a conven conventional bush which sits in the radial arm on the suspension. So this is, uh, so this is the, the axle box end. This is where it sits inside the bogey, inside metal elastic bush, um, which provides that, that your stiffness, the resistance to curving. In this case, the bush has got a, the conventional rubber element, but it's also got some oil filled capillaries in there. And the idea here is that the rubber itself is quite soft. So when that rubber gets compressed, the oil will move from one side of this chamber to the other. Therefore, if you excite the bush at a very low frequency, the oil will squeeze its way around to the other side and you'll guess, just get the stiffness that comes from the rubber. If, that, if the vehicle starts to hunt and you excite this bush at a much higher frequency, there isn't time, capacity, for the oil to actually move from one side to the other. So the oil then actually provides the stiffness and it just basically locks the bush up. So you get this variable stiffness. So you get a very soft characteristic for going around curves, but a very stiff characteristic if there's any risk of the vehicle going unstable. Again, a very nice design. The business case in terms of the reduction in track access charge that the train operator was going to get was sufficient to fund modifying the whole of the fleet of these vehicles. So all the 444 and 450 to zeros are now fitted with these hall bushes. On the back of that, a number of other fleets have also been fitted with them because they get quite a significant reduction in their track access charge. So it becomes worthwhile for the, for the train operator to do that. So the Mark, Mark IV coaches, OK, there aren't many of them left now, but they were running around for nearly 10 years on the East Coast Main Line. There's quite a few at Wales then. So. Uh, yeah, two two ones, one eight fives. All the Pendolinos have been fitted, and then the um, the Flirt um, DMUs on Anglia. They're all fitted with them from new, so they're actually designed with them in. So again, there's some things that we've been able to do which are quite good. So again, if we, if we use hindsight, we can look and we can see how things have changed, and you can start to understand why RCF suddenly became the problem it is. I created this graph a few years ago. And what I've done is basically for different rolling stock, I've got the year of design on this axis, and I've put what the what the suspension stiffness was. So you can see back in the 50s and early 60s when we were designing BR1 bogies with lots of friction damping and coil springs and everything bounced around all over the place, but they had a very soft suspension. And then we started to learn about vehicle dynamics and we started to design nice fancy radial arm suspensions which gave much better ride and much stiffer that in general the stiffness started to increase and then 
Obviously, we've had all that research into role and contact fatigue from then on. We've understood that actually it's the primary your stiffness which is driving the damage. And suddenly we've been able to start to actually drive your stiffness back down and maintain that around reasonable values. We've also been beneficial in that some of these fleets, we've actually been able to modify them. So things like the hull bushes have been introduced on fleets to bring the yaw stiffness back down, which has been beneficial. But what worries me is that some of the very new fleets that we've got in have actually started to increase your stiffness again. So my concern is that actually, are we in danger of forgetting some of the lessons that we've already learned? Um, so this is sort of part of my job on BT Sick is to to raise this yeah. as a concern. As an industry, we're very good at forgetting things. Yeah, we learned the hard way. And when you go and, and look at it, I'm not I'm not going to name and shame people, <clears throat> but when you look at it, you can see that these two particular fleets are by new entry manufacturers mm. into the UK market. Obviously, they're not they're not new manufacturers, but they're new yeah. to the new UK they market. The and these fleets have been procured directly by train operating companies. So the fleets that have been procured through like DFT's procurement, like the IEPs and um, Crossrail and Thameslink, that's where we've had the successes in driving it down. But where a train operator has gone straight to a finance house and then to a manufacturer and said, can you build me some trains? They've given them something off the shelf and we're starting to get out there, which is a bit of a concern. In other areas outside your stiffness, we've also developed wheel profiles. So there's a new, well, it's not new, it's 10 years old now, but in the stand, the wheel set standard, you can also choose a P12 wheel profile, which is a variant of P8, which is designed to actually give a little bit of relief in this area, in the flange root area, to try and reduce the forces that cause rolling contact fatigue by not contacting there so much. And that's been very successful. That's currently used on at least three fleets, to my knowledge. The Pendolino fleet use it, They've almost doubled their wheel set mileage by moving to this wheel profile. The 395s trialed it because they had a really bad hunting problem when they were first introduced. Um, and this profile solved that problem from the 380s in Scotland. So, coming near the end there, a lot of this has been about infrastructure. But let's remember that Newton's law for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if these are forces acting on the rail, there must be the same force acting on the wheel. So why don't we hear about wheel problems? Well, theoretically, where we get RCF and other forms of damage on the rail, because the force is an equal and opposite, we should also be getting exactly the same on the opposite wheel. Sure enough, we do. You don't hear a lot about it. But train operators do experience wheel RCF, and for a lot of operators, it's what limits wheel set life. So they get RCF developing on the tread, a bunch of cracks. But then it can become a problem um, because the cracks actually break out and large chunks of material actually fall out of the wheel. So rather than breaking the rail in half that we have on rails, the wheels, the cracks grow circumferentially around the wheel underneath the surface and chunks of material fall out of the wheels. And, sorry, interestingly, one of those two fleets of vehicles that I raised as having a higher primary yaw stiffness has asked me to help them investigate their RCF problem they're getting on wheels. So where they're going to be causing RCF on rails, they're also experiencing RCF on wheels. And we can apply the same modeling techniques that we use for predicting RCF to wheels. There are differences. The rail is fixed in the location in the curve. It sees lots of different vehicles. It sees lots of different wheel profiles. But it pretty much sees the same curve. Well, it does see the same curvature, but it sees pretty much the same count efficiency. On the other hand, a wheel sees the same vehicle, but it sees all curves, all count efficiencies, it's big. Sometimes it's the leading wheel set, sometimes it's a trailing wheel set, and it runs in both directions. So there's almost like there's a lot more variables to account for wheels. But when you apply the modeling techniques, you can predict that we should be getting RCF on the wheel around about here. And when you compare that with a wheel, 
sure enough, it's predicting RCF in the right place. So the forces work, the models work. The forces are equal, as Nopper said. We look. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. So. Hopefully. I've got it all into your brains now that there is science behind wheel rail interaction. Um, we do understand how vehicles curve. We know what influences the forces and we understand now a lot better the, the what's actually generated between the, the wheel and the rail. And we understand how that causes wear and tear to both the infrastructure and the vehicle. So the, the wheels experience as much damage as the rails do. Um, should we be concerned about what happens to vehicles? I'm speaking with my infrastructure manager head on. Well, we should really, shouldn't we? Because anything that's going to reduce the force on the wheel is also going to reduce the force on the rail. So what's good for the wheel should be good for the rail. So yes, we should be engaging with train operators and doing what we can to influence vehicle design and try and make things better. Point them in the right direction for alternative wheel profiles and suspension modifications and help them out with business cases. And we should also be engaged with those procuring new fleets. It's really good to get involved with problems before they happen, rather than trying to fire fight afterwards. It's much easier to change the doors if you not try. So there is there is a document which was produced by RDG. They call themselves Rail Partners now. I think it still fits in there. And it's called the Ch Key Train Requirements Document, um, and it's basically a guide for train operators who want to procure new vehicles. And it's their best practice guide as to what they should look for. It's now up to version seven. Um, the early versions didn't really say anything about the wheel rail interface, but the latest version we've managed to put some stuff in. To talk about the importance of suspension characteristics, reducing primary or stiffness can lower the amount of wear and RCF that you'll get. Things like P12 wheel profiles are good things to do. So hopefully we can actually help guide things to be better for the future. That's it from me. Any questions? I'm sure there's any questions. Any online? There's one online. Uh, I've been answering some of them as we've been going. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> um, there's one. What's the permissible Y over Q ratio used on UK lines? Um, so yeah, y over q is the derailment quotient, so it's the ratio of the lateral to the vertical force. And obviously, if the lateral force increases too much, then it will overcome the vertical force, which is trying to keep the wheel on the rail and help it climb over. So um, the railway group standard says what the what the limiting force is. Um, the actual limit does depend upon friction, but we usually work to a general limit of about 1.2. Um, but if we are doing an investigation of a particular derailment, you'll want to know what the actual limit was in that particular yeah. location because it can vary. Yeah. You're selecting a wheel profile. How much does speed play a part in um, So, yeah, so wheel profile selection really goes hand in hand in suspension design. And so, you, you know, you'll come from the point of view of designing uh, a vehicle, you know, for a particular speed um, and you'll come back to well, one of the things you'll come back to is the is the hunting analysis. You'll want to know what the stability limit is for that suspension design and that will limit your conicity and then allow you to work out what it is. But um, yeah, so uh, I suppose an example is if you want to balance um, HS2 against a tram system, they've got very different requirements. HS2 is going to need to be very stable at high speed, but they're actually designing an infrastructure that's not got any curves in it. So actually you can have a very low conicity wheel profile because you know it doesn't need to do a lot of steering. Whereas a tighter radius network or a metro system, steering is probably going to be more important than stability. Um, you know, most commuter trains aren't doing more than 75 miles an hour. So you, you can afford to have a high conicity wheel profile to get the benefits of the steering. It's been a challenge with things like javelin, doesn't it? It, it has. So yeah, they're, they're a, big, a big challenge because they were designed to work on HS1 and then pop off at Ashford and go around all the tight radius curves on the on the Kent coast. Um, yeah, for travels on you, there's certainly no disc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, any more questions? Just one observation. Um, the class 150s, 155s, thereby 153, and 156s all have um, 75 mile an hour maximum speed. Um, they have um, airbags, um, secondary yeah. suspension, no orders. No. Yet they do give a very consistently good ride. Yeah. So they all they all have PA wheel profiles on them. Um, they're they're actually not bad in terms of your stiffness. Um, so even though they've got a sort of a higher density profile, they're actually operating within their design limits. So yeah, they're, they're, they're not so much a problem. But they've got quite a soft fuel suspension because they're not as high a speed as as other vehicles. Emma. Uh, I've been told that the section of track had a problem with hunting. That they used to put cans on it. Yes. Now you can see, confirm that's true. So if I've got a section of track that's got some cans on it, straight that's got some cans on it, it's going to be relayed. Would you keep the cans on it? Um, it would depend on what the speed of the line is and what traffic it's got over it. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to hedge my bets on that one. But yeah, no, it was it, it was something that Great Western were keen on, always putting small amounts of cams on, on straight track, with the idea that if you've got camp and you've got some lateral force that the, the bogey needs to overcome. So actually, it's also always going to be doing like a little bit of steering. And hopefully that steering will be more significant than the, the hunting forces, so it will keep hunting at bay. So how are you going to know whether the vehicle's hunting or not by going cab right? Yeah. I don't think if you travel in the vehicle which is hunting, you, yeah, you know, you know it. it's pretty. Um, the old Mark 1 coaches used to be quite prone to hunting, the old uh, DMUs as well. And if you get the long speed and you've got a stretch where it can really get up some, because um, instead of damping it out, it just gets worse and worse and it just gets more and more violent. So, yeah, you will know if you get hunting. What you saw in the very first slide, yeah. um, where it can actually do, and the French had, I think, some really bad experiences with their early attempts at high speed electric trains, which did where they had that effect. You know, they didn't slip physically, the fault has got big enough to slow the track. These are really clever devices. Once upon a time, you know, used to send people out with a halal recorder. Sit it on the floor of the vehicle, try and work out where the bad bits of track were. I've, all, I've, I've always got a. If, if you want to wind me up, you tell me that the halal records track, okay? Because it doesn't. It records the vehicle's response to the track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subtle difference. Um, but these are really clever. They've got accelerometers in them. I, I routinely now will put the phone, my phone, on the floor when I'm travelling by train and just use it to record what the ride is. And I, I mean, if you want to invite me back, I've got a whole other presentation to do about vehicle hunting. Because, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's a number of cases that I'm, I'm actually helping out train operators with at the moment. Because basically they complain to our infrastructure engineers that your track's really crap because we're getting a really bad ride. And the infrastructure manager goes out, looks at the track and goes, well, nothing wrong with it. And it's because it's hunting, because it's a problem with the wheel rail interface. It's not a problem with the vehicle and it's not a problem with the track. It's a problem when you bring the two of them together. And it's then, then it's working out what is the, the most cost effective thing to do. Is it better to go and grind the rail to put a new profile on it? Or is it just the, the train operator is either using an inappropriate wheel profile or they're trying to push their wheel turning too far and the wheels are getting too worn and that's what's pushing the canicity up. Yeah. So yeah, yeah so there's a, a, a whole separate presentation of that. Yeah, that's certainly come up as a, as a ride. A lot of the train operators now are quite amenable to sharing information as well now, but not all of them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, certain bits of information. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. um, there's a couple of questions here. So um, do you have any models which show the impact lubricators and rail friction modifiers have on the contact pack, uh, match forces. Um, yes, that's certainly something you can model through uh, through vehicle dynamic simulation. Oh, um, Rob Lester has asked that. So, um, yeah, no, um, yeah we, we've done quite a lot yeah. on that. 
Okay. Yeah. But again, there's a whole separate presentation on why electric lubricators on straight track don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I can see I'm going to be coming back for the rest of the year, aren't I? Um, another one, uh, do you think the spin creepage moment affects the wear and RCF problems at the wheel rail interface? Oh, oh yeah. wow. Who's, who's, who's asked that one? Do I call Rami? Um, that's, that's a very technical question, that is. Spin creep, yes, it does. Um, but on the whole, spin creep only becomes significant when you've got higher contact angles. So for a lot of the stuff we're talking about, where the contact angles are actually quite shallow on the gauge shoulder of the, the area, um, if you ignore spin creep, it's not a significant factor. But in a lot of the simulations we do now, the, the calculations do include the effect of spin creep. And uh, last one is more of a comment from, from Deco. He said it's not just about track damage. As an S&T engineer, I have had wrong side, failure, wrong side track circuit failures caused by worn wheels because of the wheel rail interface. Talking about the PA profile as well. Yeah. 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 Again, S&C is a whole different ball game. Um, the thing about S&C is you get all forms of track damage, but just concentrated in a much smaller area than you do on a, on a plane on curve. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then there's a man professor with his hand up as well. Graham? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, if, if a track engineer was to ask you, from all your research, what would you consider the most profound discovery? What would you tell them? Oh, <laughs> profound. I don't know. I, I, I think it probably would come back to something to do with conicity because a lot of it is non-intuitive. A lot of what happens with basic wheel set curving is non-intuitive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, gauge widening on curves. People think that gauge widening on curves, well, clearly that's going to make things better because we're giving it more room, but actually... It's 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 the opposite way around. Gauge widening on curves can actually make things worse because you yeah because you're yeah. giving the, the the wheel sets more angle to rotate, more room to rotate. So you actually increase the angle of attack. So I probably point to yeah a lot of a lot of the basics of this stuff is non-intuitive, and it and it deserves thinking about a bit more. Indeed. Does thank it you. help? Yeah. No. No. Thank you. I it's. Yeah, well, you know, you're probably in a really long wheelbase, yeah, like a yes, well, yeah, it's a, yeah. it is steering, yeah, yeah, got it. Any more questions? All right, all mind blind, <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Mark. Yeah, so, uh, fascinating person. Oh, right. Somebody just put a deck, put his hand up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just one last question. Just one last question then. Um, what are we going to do about class 66 locomotives? With which particular bit of them? Well, the the, 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 yeah, they're, they're steerable bogies, they're um, worn wheel sets, their uh, inability to occupy track circuits because of their sanding equipment and their uh, non fixed axles. Well, they are. They, they, they're, they're a great. They're a great locomotive and a great design, but this is when we bought something off the shelf from abroad, and we're trying to fix the infrastructure around it. And I have had twenty years of problems with this particular type of traction package. Okay. Well, I mean, in terms of steering, I, I, I think they're actually really good at steering because no, they, they're, no, they're, they're absolutely designed to steer because they've got yeah. no fixed. They've and, only got they they've do. only got two. They've only got two fixed axles, so they yeah. they, they do. And their traction, the tractive effort that they apply to the rail is phenomenal for the locomotive. But we're having to pick the pieces up and fix our infrastructure around something that was dominantly not really designed for. Operations country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking of it from a from a uh, a wheel rail interface point of view and the steering point of view, and I think they're really 
you know. But you count right, the amount but... of wrong you you count the amount of wrong side track circuit failures we've had from a class sixty six locomotive, and uh, they are yeah, in the no, hundreds. Think... They're in the hundreds. Yeah, I. I mean, I don't know if what your involvement with those is. I, I I've not been involved much with the problem of wrong side track circuit failures. Um, but I'm not sure anyone's actually really convinced me what the cause is of that. Right. So you need to probably speak to Martin Marriott from the TA. From yeah, yeah. Network Rail. OK. Um, yeah, I so, Martin, it, yeah. it, 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 so it's a known problem. So I've worked in the rail industry for 34 years. Uh, in my days working for rail track, um, they were introduced to the infrastructure. And then we used to have a lot of wrong side track circuit failures as a as a, as a result of the class 66 locomotives. Um, that problem seems to have gone away for a long period of time or devolved or dissolved or missed in the reorganizations that we've happened. But all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, it's gone through the roof again. We've got a lot of problems with this particular locomotive, especially when it's not coupled to a train. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. As, that's, as, that's as, you, as you can imagine, naturally, naturally, because the train would drop the track circuit um we don't know why we don't know yeah. why and network rail have recently commissioned atkins the technical investigation specialists to commission a second report bear in mind that atkins have, have already commissioned a first report some years ago i think it's 2019 about the same problem with wheel rail interface with the class 66 locomotive so just Get involved with yeah. and, and email me and I'll send you the details okay. of where we got that problem. Um, but it's still yeah. ongoing. It's still ongoing. It's getting worse. It got better. It got worse. So, right. OK, just. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it is a difficult problem and partly because, you know, when, when, when you get a problem like that, it, it needs a very quick response for someone to go out and you know, look at the site and look at the wheels and find out what's happening. Is it contamination? Is it the, the wheel profile? Because I know we have cases with very hollow worn wheels, which actually well, means sometimes the wheel has been posted, contacting I've on the other I, I, have, I have posted quite a bit of chat in the uh, chat. Because um, in my early rail track days, I was uh, involved in a number of um, acceptance schemes for modern roller stock. And we had a big problem with class 175s, with them becoming quite worn, the wheel sets becoming quite worn quite yeah. quickly. Um, and that's because they were designed for French railway, which was, you know, perfect when they were on high speed compared to our southeastern, um, as an example. Um, and then in 1999, when class 66 locomotives were introduced into the rail industry, um, we had a huge spike in wrong side track circuit failures and other related problems caused by the fact that, you know, a class 66 has, you know, steerable bogies and non-fixed axles, which we hadn't had before in the rail industry. This is referring back to your tram conversation earlier on in the, in yeah. the presentation. A class 66 is in effect a heavy tram that operates on Britain's rail network for this wheel rail interface. The other thing I was going to point out earlier on, which uh, I cancelled my um, conversation point, was that what I've discovered through managing wrong side track circuit failures in the infrastructure is that certain train operators with things like the BB5000 bogey can't get wheel sets fast enough. So they, they allow them in service longer than is allowable in the standards. And they do what is called a... Uh, DRA, a dynamic risk assessment, which allows them into service for longer. But I've got a photograph of a class 172 in a bay platform at Princess Risborough, where you can see a daylight for about 20 millimetres underneath the wheel set as it's parked in the bay. Uh, Princess mm. Risborough. Now, don't get me wrong, it's parked on bullhead track that's worn yeah, when, it's yeah. the, when it's the bay platform, but it's failed to occupy 17 track circuits between Aino Junction and Bicester. Uh, um, and okay, and you think so that 
yeah, potentially and, and, could yeah. be because of the wheel hollowing. Yeah, and um, and yeah. You, the train operator train, train operator won't admit to the fact that they've left that train in service longer than it's approved. Um, let's just say beyond worn wheel set profile because they couldn't get hold of wheel sets for a B five thousand bogey. So we, an area and, 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 and it's um, not and it's not a new problem because I remember back in 1999, 98, 99 when I worked for Railtrack that we had a, a big problem after um, reprofiling of Mark II uh, well, coaches. Thank you for your. And I think there's definitely some research to be done in looking at the effect of, on um, track circuits of, of hollow wheels and things like that. So thanks very much for that contribution. But well, any more questions? Okay, in I'm the sorry room? about that. I waffled That's on right. a bit. Yeah. Any more questions in the room? Then I'd like to call on Graham Barnard to propose a vote of thanks. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, yeah, what a shame I wasn't uh, I wasn't there to, put, put, uh, to uh, join in the party games, but. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> um, I've followed Mark's work since the start of RCF. Um, and I have to say, you, you didn't mention T Gamma today, Mark. I was always scared of T Gamma. I never quite understood it. I, it was um, in the graphs. So I just didn't want to um, go into too much detail. Yeah. I, <laughs> Yeah, you helped me understand the principles of wheel rail interface, I think, more clearly than anybody else. Um, your ability to convey a very complex subject um, so clearly is a fabulous talent. Um, I think one of the principal things that I learned whilst I was an engineer was the, the small changes can have dramatic effects. Um, and all, I guess also, I mean, you mentioned but and, 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 and brushed over. Unfortunately, we always forget the things that um, that we've learned, which is uh, which is something I think the industry is is uh, is prone to. Um, Mark, thank you. I as a, I apologise. I was intending to be there. Um, I wish I'd been there in person. Um, but I would like uh, everybody, please, uh, to thank. Mark in the usual way. Mark, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you to all online. Right, so just to close the meeting, if there's any issues about the notes of the last meeting, have we any comments? So just before we wrap up, this is our last meeting for this season. So in due course, we'll be getting the notifications about the visits. Um, and in September, we, we, we convene, we've got Alex Pugh, uh, who many of you all know. He's uh, not this time online from Australia, but here in the, the flesh, as it were, to, uh, giving us a talk on some of his uh, experiences there. OK. And if anyone wants to join us at the Prince of Wales afterwards, then uh, you feel free to do so. OK, so I'll declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. I want this effect now. I don't know what happened there with that screen. The screen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I want all my toys back. I think my brother's train set and making that for an end. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.